Thanks, Ron. Uh, if I've not met you before, my name's Phil. I'm the pastor here. Uh, and a warm welcome. Uh, I'm going to explain uh, that little part of Jesus' life in just a moment. But before I do that, let me pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, we thank you for what he has done for us. Uh, Father, we pray that as we look into your word today, that you would speak to us. You would help us to see Jesus, not just uh, on the surface as everyone else saw him, but please uh, open our hearts, our eyes, our minds uh, with faith to see who Jesus really is, your King who dies to save us. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, well, if you've just joined us, uh, we've been going through uh, the book of Mark, one of the biographies of Jesus' life. Uh, and today, we're going to see that Jesus is God's saving King who dies on the cross to save us. Uh, and this is a good story. Uh, this is a rescue story. Uh, and we all love rescue stories, don't we? You, you go to the uh, cinema and there's lots of stories of brave people uh, rescuing people. In fact, um, a rescue story has been popular for a long time. You might see one of those pictures up there of the man on the horse and the dragon. Uh, that's St. George and the Dragon. That's a, uh, a painting from 1470, uh, a classic. Uh, we love this idea of someone helpless uh, being rescued. Uh, there's another older painting there from 1880 called Chivalry. You can see the knight there uh, rescuing the damsel. Uh, we love this idea of someone helpless being rescued. Uh, in fact, there's lots of uh, modern examples as well, uh, like uh, The Princess Bride or Sleeping Beauty. But all these stories, they get a little bit predictable, don't they? I don't know if you've ever been uh, sitting in a movie and thought to yourself, oh, I know how this one's going to end. Uh, you know, a bit like Sleeping Beauty, the prince goes and uh, rescues the Sleeping Beauty or in Princess Bride. If you haven't realised that yet, I'm sorry, I've ruined all of those uh, movies for you. Uh, but we love a good rescue story, don't we? Uh, but uh, in today's story, we see Jesus... Uh, he is a great king of God's kingdom and that we are the helpless ones. We are the helpless ones who he is saving. But there's two differences uh, in this story about what happens to Jesus to the classic one. The first one is, is this, this really happened. This is real history. There's a common myth that Jesus wasn't real, but every proper historian accepts that Jesus was real and he really died. Uh, the question is, uh, isn't did it really happen the question is what does it mean uh, the second thing that we'll see that's different about Jesus to the classic kind of rescue story is that Jesus's victory actually looks like defeat uh, you know how stories nowadays they like to flip the script and do something a little bit different well Jesus flipped the script a long time ago you see actually the helpless ones being rescued are the bad guys in the story it looks uh, a little bit more uh, like uh, the dragon and the damsel teaming up uh, and taking on the brave knight. Uh, Jesus is the hero who you think should ride in on a, storm, uh, on a horse and storm the castle and slay the dragon. But instead, Jesus calmly walks in, hands himself over to die, and he's killed by the very ones he came to save. So how can Christians call it a Good Friday if our King dies? Well, if you can understand this today, then you've understood the heart of Christianity. Uh, we're gonna take, I'm going to take us through this account of Jesus' death from this biography of Mark, uh, and we're going to see three things. We're going to see Jesus is God's King. We're going to see that the King is here to save. And then finally, we're going to see that to save... The king must die. Uh, have a look at our first point. Jesus is God's king. Now, on the first reading of this, it, it looks like things have gone horribly wrong. Uh, Jesus has come to be God's long-promised king to save God's people. And for the Jewish people in those days, uh, and for Jesus' followers, the bad guys, the dragon, if you will, was the Romans. Uh, the Romans were this big, bad uh, empire who occupied modern-day Israel and Palestine. And they were like that dragon in the story. And they thought Jesus was going to be like a revolutionary king and come and kick them out and save the Israelites who were kind of this damsel in distress. But this is not what happened. In fact, the people of Israel, the leaders in particular, have said, we actually don't want to be uh, saved, thank you very much. 
uh, and they brought false charges against Jesus and handed him over to the Romans. It's a bit like uh, the damsel in distress arrests the brave knight and hands him over to the cap the dragon and says, can you kill this guy for me? Uh, you think the dragon would be a bit confused? You know, don't you want to be saved? But apparently not. Uh, the Romans were quite confused uh, that the Jewish leaders hand Jesus over. And Pilate, the governor, he clearly sees that Jesus is no threat, but they kind of twist his arm into doing it. And so at the end of the day, the Romans, they just think this is a big joke. They see this weak man, Jesus, the king of the Jews, as a big joke. Uh, take a look at the passage from verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away to a place, that's the praetorium, and they called together the whole company of soldiers. And take a look at a couple of these elements. They put a purple robe on him, they twist together a crown of thorns and they set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. And then falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe, they put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Now, for the Roman army at this point, uh, Jesus basically just becomes a bit of entertainment for the boys on deployment. You know, it gets a bit boring being on deployment. Uh, and so they, they decide to dress up this man. They pretend this weak man, Jesus, is actually the king of the Jews, and they have a bit of fun. See a couple of those elements. They put a purple robe on him like a king would wear. They put a crown on his head, but a crown of thorns. They say, hail, king of the Jews, which is what they would have said to Caesar. And they even pretend to bow down and pay homage to him. But the striking thing is that Jesus never denies being the king. In fact, he willingly receives their praise as king. And this happens just as he predicted earlier. And for final good measure, they crucify him with the written notice on his head that says, uh, King of the Jews. You see, uh, it was easy to kill someone in those days. You just take them out the back and kill them. But crucifixion was a public punishment that everyone could see what this person had done wrong. And so they'd write the crime above their heads. But Jesus, he was no murderer. He was no thief. He'd done nothing except he calmly claimed that he was the king. So what do they write above his head? What's his charge? King of the Jews. And if that's not bad enough, the, the Jewish people uh, that are passing by and their leaders, they start uh, to insult Jesus, uh, claiming that he was the king there too. Uh, have a look in verse 29. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teacher of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, uh, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. You see, the leaders here are quite clear in their insults. They're saying, Jesus can't really be the king. He can't really be the Messiah because he's being killed, they say. They say, you know, if he really is the king, come down off the cross, then we'll believe you. Oh, then we'll believe you as long as you do what we say. It's a bit like the dragon and the damsel just joined forces to kill the brave king and not just kill him, but to insult him and mock him. He can't be the king. Look how weak and shameful he is. Uh, Jesus is a joke to them, not a king. But uh, as we read deeper, we see actually the jokes on them. Uh, like a magician who gets to, you, you look at one hand, uh, while he does the trick with the other, then ta-da, it looks like Jesus is no king at all, uh, that he's lost all control. But like with the magician's trick, you're, you're looking at the wrong hand. Let's walk back through slowly, and, and like a magician explaining the trick to you, we'll see what's really going on here. We see this is the king's master plan, and in fact, it's worked perfectly. King Jesus has planned and executed his own death 
perfectly. Ta-da! In fact, read it again. Jesus hasn't lost control here. He was in complete control the whole time. And we see Jesus in control in two ways. First, he's in control of himself. Uh, Throughout this whole thing, as people are insulting and mocking him, he remains with incredible composure. And second, we see he's in control of his death because this was all according to his plan. First, we see Jesus in control of himself. Uh, Jesus shows remarkable composure and calm as complete chaos erupts around him. I'm not sure about you, but if I was facing a cross, uh, I would probably panic, right? Uh, Remember, he'd been tried and found guilty of nothing except for claiming to be the king. Uh, What did they write above his head, king of the Jews? Everyone from the soldiers to the Jewish leaders are accusing him of what? Accusing him of being the king. But at any point, does Jesus deny the charge? At any point, does he say, no, 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 not guilty? No. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was, say, on trial for claiming to be the king of England, uh, and I was about to be beaten or to die for that, and all I had to do was say, uh, stop, I'm not really the king of England. I know what I'd do, right? I'd say, stop, I'm not the king, let me go. But Jesus can't lie. He is the king, and he never denies it. Every insult, every punch, every hail, king of the Jews, it's silently like he answers, yes, 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 I am the king, with an incredible, silent strength. In fact, Jesus has demonstrated his amazing power in his life. He calmed the wild storm. He could call uh, an army of demons to come and stand before him and bow. We know that he could simply have said stop at any moment or caused all those soldiers to simply cease to exist. He spoke the stars into existence. He could do that in a moment. But the strength, the strength and control to not react. Jesus shows incredible strength here, control right up to his death. So much so that the centurion, the Roman officer overseeing his crucifixion, is amazed. We hear in verse 39, the centurion stood there in front of Jesus. He saw how he died and said, surely this man was the son of God. That hardened soldier would have seen many people die. He would have killed many people. How many times would he have seen people plead and beg for mercy? But Jesus doesn't even fire back as people are insulting him. Jesus is in complete control of himself. So, uh, the second thing we see, Jesus is in control of himself, but Jesus is in control of others. Actually, this whole thing is Jesus' plan. In fact, uh, we saw uh, Jesus predict this uh, back in Mark 10. In fact, he told his disciples three times. Back in Mark 10... Uh, 33, he says, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said to his disciples. And he said, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the chiefs of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, who will spit on him, flog him, kill him, and three days later he will rise. Now, the Son of Man of Jesus' way of talking about himself there But do you see some of those details? Details Jesus predicted that he got exactly right. Handed over the chief priests, condemn him to death, hand over to the Gentiles, mock on him, spit him, flog him, kill him. Hmm, will he get the rise three days later one right as well? You'll have to come on Sunday to find out. I know a lot of people who love to be in control, right? Uh, You know what I mean. They love to control their lives, plan everything out uh, in a calendar. But here, Jesus knows the particulars of his own death. Now, there's no way any human can control this unless he's the king, God's king. It's a bit like planning your own funeral. I don't know about you. Have you planned your own funeral? Uh, You know, maybe you've got it all written out. You look, first they'll play my favorite song. Uh, Then they'll release 11 white doves. Uh, Then my friends will get up uh, and they'll say, what a great guy I was. In fact, I've written out the speech for them, telling them how great I'm, I'm kidding. 
But I can tell you what, I've been involved in a few funerals and it never goes quite to the plan that you had in mind. But Jesus here, he knows exactly what's going to happen. He really is the king. In fact, he's planned it. In fact, we know his plan goes back even further. Um, if we take a look at Psalm 22, oh, that's a bit small to see on the screen, isn't it? Uh, the plan goes back uh, hundreds of years, and we'll see how in control Jesus is. In Psalm 22, this is a song uh, written hundreds of years beforehand. We see some details that show how planned this is. Psalm 22:18 says, They divided my clothes among them and cast God's lots for my garment. What do we see in our passage in verse 24? They crucified him, dividing his clothes and casting lots to see what he would get. Again, from Psalm 22, remember, this is a song written hundreds of years before. They say, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads, saying, he trusts the Lord, they said. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And we saw in our passage, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. And just in case you missed it, uh, the very start of Psalm 22, uh, Jesus quotes on the cross. Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what does Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just in case you missed the connection. Uh, Jesus is in control of himself. He's in complete control of his death. What's happening here is called irony irony they mock and laugh jesus as king but he really is the king the crown of thorns is a true crown for he is the true king like i said before if you can understand what's going on here you're beginning to understand christianity to understand jesus on the surface it looks like a defeat but in reality this is jesus's master plan his crowning moment Jesus is God's king, and the king is here to save. We see in our second point, the king is here to save. Remember at the start, we were talking about rescue stories uh, and the brave king who saves the princess from the dragon. And Jesus is here to save and rescue. But unlike, uh, you know, that, that brave king on a white horse storming the castle, uh, Jesus calmly walks into his own execution. In fact, we saw Jesus planned his own execution. And on our first glance, it looks like Jesus can't even save himself. Uh, I mean, he can't, he can't, well, how on earth could he save others if he can't even save himself? Uh, but we're going to have a second glance, and we're going to see that it's by not saving himself that Jesus can save others. Uh, most people have a first glance, and it looks like Jesus is weak, but we're going to have a second glance. It's a little bit like this picture here. Uh, have a look at the picture, and just in your own head, uh, what animal can you see? Uh, if you can see a duck, uh, put your hand up. All right, hand down. Uh, if you can see another animal, what can you see? A rabbit. Uh, take another look at that picture. Maybe turn your head to one side. Uh, if the duck's bill are actually rabbit's ears... Can you see that again? Can you kind of see that? On first glance, it just looks like a duck. But on a closer inspection, you can see actually it's a rabbit. Uh, as we look through Jesus' death, on first glance, it looks like he's totally powerless. He's not in control. And most people uh, this Friday will just drive on past and not think about Jesus. But we're going to take the time to take the second glance we're going to see actually uh, Jesus is completely powerful here. So let's go through and have our first glance. Uh, in verse 27, we're told they crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Uh, we see on first glance, it looks like Jesus can't sa even save himself. Verse 30, we see they say, come down, save yourself. He can't really be this powerful king. And this proves that he couldn't save anyone, they think. Verse 31, he saved others but can't save himself. Now, obviously, if you were powerful, you'd save yourself, right? 
But the irony is that in order to save others, Jesus must not save himself. This is the kind of king we're dealing with here. Or verse 32, they say, come down from the cross. If you're really the king, we'll believe you. Uh, They say, Jesus, if you bring yourself down as this powerful king, then we'll believe you. But the irony is, unless he dies for your sins, you will never believe in him. And so, at first glance, it looks like Jesus can't be God's king, and it looks like he can't even save himself. But we're going to have that second glance, that closer look. We'll see that Jesus is God's king, and by not saving others, uh, not saving himself, that's how he can save others. And we're going to see this in two ways. First, we're going to look at the temple, uh, and then we're going to see uh, that he can't save himself. Uh, in 29, the passers-by say something in particular, don't they? They say, uh, you are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days. Now, this was, was a claim that Jesus was making, that he was going to destroy their temple and build it in three days. Now, the people walking by are obviously going, well, you know, like that guy who says, oh, I'm always going to do renos, I'm always going to do renos, I'm always, and he never gets around to it. Well, Jesus is obviously never going to get around to it because he's dying. But the irony is the temple, the place where humans meet with God and where God forgives their sins, this, it's the work of the temple that Jesus is doing on the cross. And as he dies, God is meeting with humanity and through his death forgiving their sins. Those people walking past, they spoke better than they knew. It's the work of the temple that exactly what Jesus is doing. Uh, In verse 30 out of 32, they say, If you could save others, uh, then why don't you save yourself? But again, they speak better than they know. Jesus can save others. He has saved others. But to save them, he must not save himself. He looks weak, like he doesn't have strength. But Jesus has incredible power here to stay on that cross and to die. Then in verse 32, they say, Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down that we might believe in him. The implication is, if you're a king, what are you going to do? You're going to save yourself, right? That's what most kings would do. But you don't know anything about this king. Jesus is not like most other kings. This king that we're dealing with him is so committed to saving others that he does not save himself. Remember the duck and the rabbit. In Jesus' death, Mark wants us to take the second glance and see what's really going on here. Uh, Jesus doesn't save himself to save others, to save you. And Jesus is a king like no other king. He's here to save others. Uh, Now, we've all known people uh, who just want to save themselves, right? You know, you might have had a boss in a workplace, uh, and they think to themselves, hmm, I'll save myself that work, and I'll get you to do it. They save themselves, not others. Uh, We've known other people like that who throw others under the bus. They make it their fault. Our instinct to save ourselves is strong, and yet we respect and are thankful for those who do save others. And this is what Jesus does here. Jesus is God's king who came to save others. Uh, But, you know, uh, we've got to take that second glance. You see, most people don't. They just insulted and walk on by. They didn't turn their head to take a closer look. Uh, And that's what we'll do in the next part. To save, the king must die. Uh, Let me keep reading from verse 37. We're going to uh, focus in on verse 37 and 39 now. Verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he says, surely this man was the Son of God. In our last part, we're going to focus on these two things that happen when Jesus has died. Uh, First, the temple curtain is torn. Now, the curtain represents the separation between God and people. It's a bit like a safety wall around a nuclear reactor. You see, people have rebelled against God, and God should rightly penalize and judge and destroy humans. But the curtain in the temple acts like a bit of a barrier, a shield, and that now by tearing the curtain, the way to God is open. But to do that, the debt and the penalty must be paid. In the temple back then, what they used to do was they'd have sacrifices. 
Uh, an animal would die instead of a person. And here Jesus dies as a sacrifice to take the penalty for the debt that the humans deserve. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is a little bit difficult to understand in our culture. We don't use these kind of categories of justice much. Uh, take a look, for instance, in what we call jails. Uh, what are we used to call jails? Uh, what was Australia? It was a penal colony, wasn't it? Uh, do you know, uh, penal comes from the word punishment, pain. Uh, when someone went to jail, we used to think they were being punished for their crime. You know, that saying, do the crime, uh, do the time. Uh, but we've kind of moved away from that as a society. Now, what do we call jails? We call them correctional facilities for rehabilitation. Uh, people aren't being punished, they're being rehabilitated. Now, this is not unreasonable. There's certainly room for rehabilitation, but it's not the same focus on penalty or punishment. And it's because as a society today, we don't like the idea of people being punished, do we? And we've seen extreme examples of that. Take, for instance, Australia. Steal a loaf of bread in England, get exiled to Australia forever. That's what happened to the convicts. But when it comes to Jesus dying on the cross for the penalty for our rebellion, uh, people find that very difficult. Uh, one of these people in particular uh, would be um, Richard Dawkins. Uh, Richard Dawkins is a famous atheist who's written lots of books uh, about Christianity. Uh, and here he uh, has this quote, and I think uh, Dawkins is insightful in what he says. In fact, I think Dawkins is right about a lot of things. Yes, I just said an atheist is right, um, but I think he's wrong about some things as well. Let me read the quote for you. Uh, this is from his book, The God Delusion. He says, I've described the atonement, that's Jesus' death for sin, uh, the central doctrine of Christianity as vicious. We should also dismiss it as barking mad. But for this ubiquitous familiarity, which has dulled our objectivity, that's just him using very smart English speech to say we're, we're too familiar with it. If God wanted to forgive our sins, then why not just forgive them without having himself tortured and executed in payment? Now, like I said, I, I think Dawkins says three insightful things here. The first is he talks about the atonement, Jesus dying for sins as the central doctrine of Christianity. And I want to say, yes, he's right. This is what it's all about, folks. This is it. Dawkins is no fool. And it's vicious. It's vicious that Jesus is murdered so that we can come to God. That's uncomfortable, to say the least. The second thing I think he notices that's insightful is that everyone's forgotten about it. He says in his very, you know, learned speech, our familiarity to Jesus' death on the cross to save has dulled us to the reality. Dawkins is right again. We take it for granted. Millions of Australians are having a day off uh, today and having a very long weekend. Why? Because Jesus was murdered on a cross. But everyone just kind of shrugs, don't they? We're so familiar with it, we don't bat an eyelid. It's a little bit like how we treat Anzac Day. Everyone just goes, oh great, a public holiday, but forgets the sacrifice of those soldiers who died. And it's the same at Easter. And Jesus didn't just die for us to have a long weekend. He died for the penalty so that you can be forgiven. But Dawkins is right. We're all so familiar, aren't we? Third thing, uh, and I think it's an insightful question, Dawkins asked, why doesn't God just forgive sin? Why doesn't God just forgive if he wants to? Why does he have to die? He says that God has himself tortured and executed in payment. And again, Dawkins is right here. God is punishing himself instead of punishing us. And this is not an unreasonable question from Dawkins. Uh, since we don't think as a society that punishment is necessary anymore, do we? Uh, we don't think that, you know, penalty is due for crimes. We say uh, it's no longer do the crime, do the time. We think people should just be forgiven without punishment. And here's the point where I think Dawkins is wrong. The reality is forgiveness is not free. It's not like forgiveness is just click, it's gone. No, there's always a cost in forgiveness. What Dawkins uh, and, and often we do is we forget that someone always bears the cost for wrongdoing. 
and we understand this as a society, don't we? There's always a cost for wrongdoing. Uh, justice is, you do the crime, you do the time. Injustice is, you do the crime and someone else does the time or pays the cost. Uh, let me play this out for you. Imagine a man has brutally murdered someone and he stands before the judge and the case is clear. He's found guilty. But then the judge says, ah, I'll just forgive you. You're forgiven. You know, have a nice day. And the murderer walks free, paying no cost. Well, it looks like there's no cost, but the reality is someone always pays the cost. The family that don't receive justice, they pay a cost. The man may well very go and murder someone else. That next person pays the cost. Society pays the cost. As you can see, well, you can just murder people and get away with it. There's no cost. But the truth is, someone always pays the cost in wrongdoing and someone always pays the cost in forgiveness. Not the judge, he just says forgiven. Not the criminal, he goes free. No, everyone else pays the cost to forgive this criminal. And Dawkins is right here. God is executed to pay for our penalty. In the cross, Jesus pays the cost. It's like the judge saying, I'll forgive you, but I'll go to jail in your place. Jesus is the king, uh, God's judge himself, and he pays the cost for our crimes. And this is the second thing to notice about the death of Jesus. Uh, we saw uh, the curtain, but now we see the most unlikely person recognizes Jesus as king. Uh, did you notice that? Uh, in verse uh, 39, when the centurion uh, stood in front of Jesus and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Now, this centurion would have been a Roman officer in charge of Jesus' execution that day, and he is the last person you think uh, would see what everyone else here is missing. Jesus really was the king. He says, surely this man was the son of God. Uh, now, the son of God doesn't immediately sound like king to us, but to the Jews, they called their king the son of God. And the Romans, they also called Caesar the son of God. Augustus Caesar was known as the son of God. In fact, many Romans worship Caesar as a god. And so it's incredible here that this Roman soldier recognizes what no one else does, that Jesus is the true son of God, the king, and not Caesar, who that Roman soldier had been serving his own life. Why? Why can he see what no one else can? Because we're sure that he uh, sees how Jesus died. Now, this soldier would have seen many people die, uh, he would have executed many people, but with Jesus, it was different. He was attacked and, and mocked and beaten, and yet with such dignity and control, he dies willingly. It's likely this soldier had the whole lead-up to Jesus' death in mind. Perhaps he was the one who ordered the soldiers, go on, boys, go and strike Jesus. Uh, maybe he came up with the idea, dress him up like a king, say, hail, king of the Jews. Maybe he nailed that sign to the cross, king of the Jews, as Jesus' only crime. But now he sees the jokes on them. He really is the king of the Jews. It's likely that he would have been there at that moment, Jesus' coronation, when the crown of thorns was put on his head. Who knows? Maybe that centurion himself had the strange honour of putting that crown on Jesus' head and seeing those eyes look back at him. Whatever happened, now he can see Jesus really is the king who's come to save, but he can't save himself. And so the king must die to pay the cost. Well, what about you? Uh, everyone missed that day except for one man who Jesus really was. Do you really see who Jesus is? Remember the picture of the duck and the rabbit? Most people will slide past this day not seeing who Jesus is, not accepting what King Jesus offers. Forgiveness. Someone must die for your sins, take the penalty, either you or him. But Jesus is the king who offers himself. Will you take it? Will you see who Jesus is and throw yourself on him and say, please, Jesus, save me? Let me encourage you to do that today or to do that again as we really see who Jesus is, our King who came to save. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, We thank you for the incredible control and plan that he had to go to the cross that day and die. We thank you that he truly is your king and our king. We thank you that he's the kind of king who doesn't sacrifice his people, but sacrifices himself. Father, we know that the penalty, the weight of our rebellion and sin and ignoring of you uh, would weigh heavy on us, except that it weighed on Jesus that day. Father, we're so thankful for that. Uh, We gladly accept and receive it. And we pray that you'd help us to live our lives as subjects uh, who love and rejoice and glorify you in our wonderful King Jesus, our King who died to save us.